4D is about properties of quadratic functions, or to put it another way, it's about things that you can figure out if you don't have the graph. So in 4C, we actually had the graph there, and then a lot of these things that we do in 4D, like figuring out what the domain and range would be, or figuring out where the vertex is, if you have the graph right in front of you, then basically you would just look at the graph and you could do it. But if you don't have the graph, you can still do those things algebraically, and that's mostly what this section is about. So first of all, there are a couple of forms of writing out a quadratic function. There's the general form, and then there's a standard form that we'll get to in a little bit. But general form first, so it looks like that, where we have f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, um, a, b, and c being some real numbers, and a can't be zero, because if a was zero, you'd have no x squared term, and it wouldn't be a quadratic function anymore. It would be a linear function, assuming that b isn't zero. Um, then the first thing is, how can you tell if the parabola is going to open up or down? Because those are the two options, right? Either you get a parabola that's shaped like that, or you get a parabola that's shaped like that. So either it opens up or it opens down. And this is actually pretty straightforward. You just have to use the coefficient of the x squared. So whatever number is multiplied by x squared, that's going to tell you. Because if that number is positive, then it's going to open upward, so it's going to be the U shape, right? So, so this is upward here. And then this one next to it is downward. And if the coefficient of the x squared is negative, then it's going to open downward. So to figure out if it opens upward or downward, that part's actually pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> assuming that you have everything written out in general form, right? With the, the terms in the right order and everything, then you just look at the first term. Um, the other thing here is the vertex formula, which as sort of a consequence, you also get the axis of symmetry because if you know what the x coordinate of the vertex is, you can just say, well, the axis of symmetry has to go through that. So just knowing it's x coordinate would be enough to go, oh, it's the vertical line that goes through that point right there. Um, but the vertex formula, um, it's a formula to get the x coordinate of the vertex. Um, and like it says right there, it's the negation of b over 2a, where b, like up above, it's the number that's multiplied by x, so the coefficient of the x, and then a is the coefficient of x squared. Um, and then if you want the y-coordinate of the vertex, so like if you were going to actually make the graph by hand and you wanted to plot the point, then you would just take whatever the x-coordinate is and sub it back into the function. We're going to do that in a minute. Um, and then as a consequence, the axis of symmetry is the vertical line that goes through the vertex, so it's going to be x equals negative b over 2a, it's that vertical line. All right, so this first example, um, this isn't exactly what you have to do in the homework, it's actually more intensive. So I figured if this was doable, then what would be in the homework would be doable. Um, and this also felt like it had kind of like a final step, like building up to the graph, I kind of like that. Um, so the first thing, um, just kind of looking at that function up there, um, to figure out if the parabola opens upward or downward. I guess before we do anything else, we could just kind of um, identify what a, b, and c are. So looking at that function right there, then a is 2, b is negative 8, and then c is 5. Right, so just to use the a, b, and the c like they're written up above in the generalized version of general form. The general is in that sentence an awful lot of times. Um, but the first thing is, does the parabola open upward or downward? Well, a, the coefficient of x squared is 2, which is positive, so it opens upward. All right, so for part a, we know that a is equal to 2, and that means that the parabola opens upward. Then part b, figuring out the vertex and the axis of symmetry. All right, so for B, for the vertex, basically what we're going to do is get the vertex, and then we'll just sort of get the axis of symmetry for free. So the x-coordinate of the vertex would be the negation of B over 2A, and if we sub in, B is negative 8, and then A is 2. So the negation of negative 8 over 2 times 2. So then it looks like that's going to be the negation of negative 8 over 4, so that's the negation of negative 2, which is 2. 
All right, and then if we want the whole vertex, like both coordinates rather than just the x-coordinate, then to get the y-coordinate, we just need f of two. So then f of two would be two times two squared minus eight times two plus five. So let's see, that's, um, I guess you would do the exponent first, um, right? So you'd have two times four minus eight times two plus five. Then I guess those two multiplications, right? So eight minus 16 plus five, which would be negative eight plus five, which is negative three. Okay, so that means that our vertex, if we wanna write it as an ordered pair, would be the point two, negative three. And we're eventually gonna graph this, so I might as well go ahead and put it over here in the graph. So two negative three is right there. So there's our vertex. And we know it opens up, so it's gonna be the U shape, and that's gonna be the lowest point. Because the vertex is either gonna be the lowest point or the highest point. Uh, if it opens up, it's gonna be the lowest point, it's gonna be down the bottom, it's gonna be the bottom of the U. And if it opens down, it's gonna be the highest point, so it's gonna be up at the top of the hump. And we'll see that in another example. We'll have one that opens down, but not here. And the other thing, the reason I put finding the y-intercept in here is because I just kind of wanted to show what the axis of symmetry is actually for. Um, because otherwise, it seems like it's just sort of there. Um, but I can show you what you do with it. Because basically, you can graph the whole parabola with two points. You need the vertex. You have to have the vertex. But if you just have any other point on the parabola, it doesn't matter which one, that's enough. And the easiest other point to get would be the y-intercept because the algebra is so simple. If you sub in zeros, the first two terms are going to go to zero and you're just going to end up with five. So that's why I picked the y-intercept for part C. I wanted to make that as simple as we could. So in order to figure out the y-intercept, we would just need to figure out what f of zero is. And that's going to be two times zero squared minus eight times zero plus five, and really that's zero minus zero plus five. So ultimately it's a five, which I'm just gonna write since I don't really have a lot of room next to that graph. And so that means that the y-intercept is gonna be the point zero five. So that's also a point on the graph and that's way up here. And I did not do myself a lot of favors with this. Uh, I gotta draw you through that on a tablet. I don't know what I was thinking about um, this is actually going to be tough. There's a lot of ground to cover. We'll, we'll see if it works. <clears throat> the other thing is, so how does the axis of symmetry factor into this? Um, let me draw it in, but I'm going to draw it in a different color. Um, I'll make it red. So the axis of symmetry, we know it's going to go through the vertex, right? So it's going to be this. And it's going to be the vertical line going through the vertex. So that's x equals 2. Um, the way that you use it, is you can use it as a guide to get a point on the other side of the parabola to draw the whole thing in. So notice where zero five is, like in relation to the axis of symmetry, like it's two units to the left. So if I go two units to the right, but at the same height, right? Like the same distance up from the x-axis. So I'm gonna stay at five, I'm gonna go two to the right. So right over here, that has to be a point on the parabola. That's how you can use the axis of symmetry, right? Because if you fold the parabola over, I guess if you fold along the axis of symmetry, the parabola would end up lying on top of itself, right? So basically you use that, um, and that's how you could draw the parabola essentially by figuring out what two points are. Um, and usually, like, when this shows up, like, in a textbook, um, they, it's always done with, like, I don't know, like, seven points or something, maybe five. Um, but you don't really need that many. Um, you really only need two. And then let me see if I can draw this and make it look halfway presentable. Mm. That side turned out a lot better. Okay, the right side turned out better than I thought that I would be capable of. I suppose that's a plus. Um, so that's two negative three on the bottom, which is our vertex. Right? And then we, we'd figured out that that was 0, 5 right there. And then this point over here is 4, 5, I mean, if you want to label it. Um, but then right there, so that's our vertex. 
and it's the lowest point, right? It's at the bottom of the U, right? Looking at the picture, you go, well, yeah, sure. Um, but that's what happens. If you have a parabola that opens upward, the vertex is always going to be at the lowest point. But I'll put that in parentheses here that that's at the lowest point. All right, so we did everything we were supposed to do with that one. Um, there's a second example, and you know what it's going to be. It's going to be a parabola that opens down. Not that that's like me ruining a surprise or anything, because you're going to see it right away anyway, right, with that negative in front of the x squared. So I don't feel like I'm spoiling it at all. Um, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to do. Um, I think I have enough space. So even though this isn't actually part of the problem, um, we could get the domain and range of this. So before we get to number two, let's just do this. I think I can write them underneath the graph. So the domain, um, basically the domain is going to be all real numbers because, and it's going to be that way for every quadratic function. There are never going to be any restrictions. The only things that would cause trouble as far as the domain goes, and I guess, let me scroll up to where we can, there we go. We can see it now, the 2x squared minus 8x plus 5. The only things that ever cause trouble with the domain are division by zero and even roots of negative numbers, like the square root of a negative number and that kind of thing. Those are impossible here because there are no roots in that expression and um, there's nothing there where there's a variable and a denominator. Right? Like, it really, it's just a polynomial. And with a polynomial, there are no restrictions. You can sub any value in for x that you want. So the domain for every quadratic function is going to be all real numbers. Every single time. So the domain would be all real numbers. And... The homework goes back and forth where there are some questions where they ask for the domain range where um, it's just done um, either where you would say like all real numbers or maybe for the range just like write out an inequality. But then there are some where they ask for an interval notation. So I think that's worth it to write this as an interval because it may show up and I think it will probably show up once or twice. Um, but when it's all real numbers... So that's from negative infinity to positive infinity. And I think when they show up, you just have to pick them out of a lineup. So you don't have to actually type them in. Um, but on the off chance that you do, and just the two times I ran through the homework, it never came up. I highly doubt that this would happen. But if you did have to type them in, just remember that when you have the infinity or negative infinity, those aren't actual numbers. So you wouldn't include them as endpoints. So you need to have parentheses, not brackets. Then the other thing is the range. And if you look at that, that's not all real numbers. Because if you look at the picture, there is a lowest point, right? Um, and it has a y coordinate of 3, or negative 3, rather. Um, there's no highest point, right? Those arrows, they just keep going up. Well, they keep, one goes up to the, uh, like, kind of upward to the left, and the other one goes upward to the right. But generally, they're going up, right? So everything above negative 3 is covered somewhere. So you could say that the range would be the set of all y values such that y is at least negative 3. So it's going to be a greater than or equal to because we do have an actual point where the y coordinate is negative 3. Um, and if you're going to write that with intervals, so the lower end point is the negative 3 and we want to include it, so bracket around the negative 3. And then there's no upper end point, so going up to infinity and parentheses around that. All right, that's the other thing I wanted to add in. Now to number two, where number two will open downward. All right, so what we got with number two, let's see. So from here, we've got um, that a is negative one, right? Because that negative x squared, you could think of as negative one times x squared, and that would be the same thing. Um, then b is negative two, and then c is one. All right, so then for part A, does it open upward or downward? Well, A, the coefficient of x squared is negative. It's negative 1, so that means it's going to open downward. So A equals negative 1. That means that the parabola opens downward. Let's see, then... Um, 
Oh, and I don't think I wrote out what the what the x of symmetry was in number one. I mean, I drew it that it's x equals two, but I don't think I wrote it in. Um, I don't just go back up and check. Nope. All right. Um, I'll write it real small in here. The axis of symmetry. It's x equals two. All right. Yeah, I just kind of got excited about making the graph. I think. Um, and forgot to write it down because it's there, right? it's in red, but I didn't write it in. Um, all right, so the vertex, uh, we're going to use the vertex formula again. So we're going to have that x is the negation of b over 2a, and there are going to be an awful lot of negatives in this. It's going to be the negation of negative 2 over 2 times negative 1. Um, all right, so that's the negation of negative 2 over negative two. So really that ends up just being negative one, right? Negative two over negative two is one. So you get negative one altogether. And then we need the y coordinate. So f of negative one, that'll be the negation of negative one squared minus two times negative one plus one. All right, so negative one squared is one. So that's negative the negation of one now, right? Um, minus 2 times negative 1 and then plus 1. So that's negative 1 minus negative 2 plus 1, which is negative 1 plus 2 plus 1. And if you add those together, you get 2. All right, so then that means that the vertex, if you want to write it as an ordered pair, would be negative 1 2 and the axis of symmetry is going to be x equals negative 1. And so let's see. Um, last thing is the intercept. I think I got enough space for this. So um, for the y intercept, it would just be f of 0 to figure out the y coordinate. So it's the negation of 0 squared minus 2 times 0 plus one, and so that's just one, right? And it's always that. If you have it written in general form, the y-intercept is always the constant term at the end, because everything else just goes to zero when you sub in zeros for x's. And so then that means that our y-intercept is gonna be the point zero, one. All right, so our two points, we've got negative one, two as the vertex, we got zero, one, um, and I can do what we did last time. We can put in the x of symmetry and, oops, and draw the other point. Let's see, so x of symmetry. It's going to open down, so I'm going to draw it underneath this time. And then, let's see, we just need one other point. And if you look at where 0, 1 is, so it's one unit to the right of where the axis of symmetry is located. So then I'm just going to go one to the left. We're going to end up there. That would also be a point. And then that should be enough to draw this thing. And this one's much easier on me since the points are so close together. There, something like that, right? Where there's our vertex right there of negative one, two. Um, and there's zero, one. And then over here is negative 2, 1. Um, all right, so then I'll just label it the same way as the last one. So there's our vertex, which here is the highest point, which will always happen if you have a parabola that opens down. Your vertex is always going to be at the top of the hump. So that's going to be the highest point. And then if we're doing everything we did in the last one, um, the domain and range, which I think I got to squeeze in like kind of up in the upper right corner above the graph. Um, so the domain, still all real numbers. Or if you'd prefer it written in interval notation, negative infinity to positive infinity. Then the range um, if you look at the graph, you can see it. There's a highest point. So um, like the highest y value, the biggest y value that's going to be part of the range is 2. 
Um, there's nothing above two, but everything below two is covered somewhere because we got those arrows on the ends of the parabola that are pointing downward. So what I would say here is you could write it as the set of all y such that y is less than or equal to two, right? That would cover two and everything below it. Or if you want that as an interval, it would be from negative infinity, since there is no lower bound, um, up to two, and we're including the two, so bracket on the two. Something like that. All right, then number three is more of um, <clears throat> the kind of thing that you get on the homework, um, where there's no graph, where it's just um, figure out if it opens upward or downward, figure out the vertex, and get the domain range without actually using the graph. Um, the thing that you would use to get the domain and range, um, I guess for the domain, you don't really have to do anything. It's just gonna be all real numbers because there won't be any restrictions. Um, but for the range, you use the vertex. You use the vertex and then whether the parabola opens up or down. Those are the two things that you need. Um, so let's see then with part A, um, if we look at that function, the five X squared plus 20 X minus six. So there, I forgot to switch colors back. Not that that really matters, but keep it consistent. Um, all right, so the leading coefficient, the coefficient of the x squared is five. That's a positive number, so it opens upward. So a equals five, that means that the parabola opens upward. Then the vertex, all right, so vertex formula again, x equals the negation of b over 2a. And if we sub in, we're gonna get the negation of 20 over five times two, or two times five. Um, I guess I, I switched the order, but it's multiplication, same thing in the reverse order, I guess. So the negation of 20 over, well, I'm not writing like that again. Simplify, otherwise we'll never get done. Uh, negative 20 over 10, so that's negative two. And so if you want the y coordinate, it would be f of negative two, which is going to be five times negative two squared plus 20 times negative two minus six. So let's see, that's five times four um, and then plus 20 times negative two, then minus six. All right, doing the multiplication, 20 plus negative 40, and then minus six. So that's negative 20 minus six, which is negative 26. So the vertex is the point negative two, negative 26, um, but the next thing is just, is that the highest or the lowest point? Because you need that to figure the range out. That's going to be the lowest point because the parabola opens upward. So that is the lowest point. Since the parabola opens upward, right? Because we know if it opens upward, it's gonna be shaped like that. So then the vertex is gonna be right down there, right? Um, that's where our negative two, negative 26 is gonna be. All right, so then the last thing is to get the domain range. Well, the domain, as ever, no restrictions. So the domain is just gonna be, once again, all real numbers or as an interval, negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, and then the range. So if that's the lowest point, then nothing below negative 26 is gonna show up, but everything above negative 26 would be covered somewhere, right? Uh, you might have to go farther up the parabola, but eventually you'd get there. So the range you could say would be the set of all y such that y is at least negative 26, or greater than or equal to negative 26, or if you'd rather have this as an interval, 
So that would be negative 26 is the lower bound, which we're going to include because we have a point with that y coordinate. So bracket around the negative 26 and then up to infinity like that. So those are the kinds of things that you get with the homework. They tend to look more like number three than number one and two. So number one and two had extra stuff like, like doing the graph, but I figured if those make sense, then the rest of them um, hopefully will make sense too, where you end up doing kind of graph related things without the graph actually there, right? Like knowing that the vertex is gonna be the lowest point. Like you can figure that out without using the graph, right? It's just that you need to know which way the parabola opens. And then you just have to look at the coefficient of x squared to figure that out. All right, so general form is one way to do it. The other way to, um, to write out the equation of a quadratic function is standard form. Um, so standard form looks like this up here, where we have that f of x is a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k, where a, h, and k are real numbers. Um, I figured it made sense to go through what those actually mean um, because it's not obvious why you would write the function like this, right? Like this looks unnecessarily difficult compared to the other one, right? The one where it's all simplifying, you just have the x squared term, the x term, the constant. That looks easier than this. So like, why would you do this, right? Like there must be some reason why this would be used. Um, there is. Um, and it's, if you want to think about um, transformations of the basic function f of x equals x squared, right? Like that, the f of x equals x squared, that's the simplest quadratic function you could have. And you could build any other quadratic function from that by like doing shifts and compressions and stretches and reflections and stuff. So I figured it was worth at least a run through with this, even though you don't actually need it to answer the questions in the homework. All right, so the A out front um, could be one thing or another thing or both. Um, um, it could be a stretch or a compression um, where then it's just like a multiplier. And then it just depends on if the multiplier um, has an absolute value larger or smaller than one. Um, if it's larger than one, um, then you've got a stretch and it's going to stretch the parabola out. So like if you grabbed on, the, I guess, the bottom of the parabola and like the top of the graph, like up higher up and like pulled, it would make the parabola thinner, um, kind of. That's, that's what the stretch is like. Um, and the compression is like the opposite. Like if you like squeeze the parabola like vertically. Um, so and you get the compression when um, the absolute value of A of that multiplier is less than one. Um, and then the reflection um, that's what turns it upside down. And that's if that coefficient or that multiplier up front is negative, right? Um, and we kind of already went through that part before. Like if you have the negative coefficient of x squared, then it opens down. Um, if a was negative here and you multiplied everything out, you'd get a negative coefficient of x squared. Um, so therefore it would open downward. Um, and you can see those things in the first row of pictures here. So there's the, the, on the left, you got the basic function, just f of x equals x squared, um, where like the vertex is right at the origin and it opens up, right? And the other points that are gonna be on it would be like one, one, two, four, which you can see, right, that it goes through two, four. Um, and on the other side, I guess uh, you could see negative one, one, and then negative two, four. Um, but then if you look at the, the three x squared, um, it's still, like that parabola shape, but it's thinner. So that's the one that's the stretch, right? Because that number that's being multiplied by x squared, um, it has an absolute value larger than one. So it's stretched, which makes it look thinner. Um, and then the third one where it's got the one half x squared, um, that one half that's being multiplied by the x squared, that's less than one, right? So then it looks wider, right? Look at that graph compared to the one that's on the far left, right? Definitely wider. Um, and then the last one is upside down, right? It opens downward. Um, so that's the reflection. So it's like a reflection through the x-axis, basically. So the origin um, is still going to be your vertex. It's just instead of opening up with the u, it just kind of goes like that. Um, and so that, that first thing, that a, that can actually be a whole bunch of different things. Because then it can be combinations of like, 
you don't have to just have one of these. You could have um, a stretch and a reflection at the same time. Like what if A was like negative five, right? Then you've got the stretch, but it's also negative. So you got the reflection too. Um, so you can have that. Um, then the horizontal shift, um, that second uh, thing that we have to talk about, so the H, this is sort of tough um, if you're not used to it because it's really easy to get this backwards because essentially what you do is you replace X with something else. So it's like X plus or minus something, that, like plus or minus some number that gets squared rather than just X getting squared. Um, the thing that's counterintuitive is that when there's a minus, that's a shift to the right. And when there's a plus, that's a shift to the left. So like it says there, um, x minus three quantity squared, that takes the regular f of x equals x squared parabola, moves it three to the right. And then x plus four quantity squared moves it four to the left. The reason that feels weird, I think, is just because of the way the number line's set up, right? Number line positive is to the right and negative is to the left. And it's like, well, now you're telling me when there's a minus, that goes to the right. And then there's a the plus that goes to the left. Um, yeah, it feels backwards. Um, and if, I don't know, if we were doing like pre-calculus, I guess, then we would probably like delve really deep into this. But I figured it was worth pointing out just to kind of say like, yeah, this is the way that this is set up. Um, but that does feel weird um, if you're not used to it. The vertical shift doesn't. The vertical shift works the way that you would think it would work. Um, so that's just the K, the number tacked onto the end. Um, if it's positive, that's a shift upward. And if it's negative, that's a shift downward. And you think, okay, that one works the way that it's supposed to work. Yeah, right? Like that one feels pretty natural. If you have x squared plus five, it'll look just like the x squared parabola just moved up five units. Um, x squared minus two looks just like the regular x squared parabola, but moved down two units. So I've got pictures of them in here too, in the second row. So there is the horizontal shift of three to the right. Look at where the vertex is. Right, because you can still see there. Now I've got the labeling on there too. So the original function, the f of x equals x squared in the upper left, its vertex is at the origin. It's at zero, zero. Look at where it is for the graph directly underneath it. It's at three, zero. So it's three to the right. And then the one with the x plus four being squared, the vertex is at negative four, zero. So it's four to the left compared to the original function. Um, and then the last two are the vertical shifts. So you've got the shift up five. So look at that one's vertex. It's at zero five, right? So instead of zero, 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 five, five units up. And then the last one, the vertex is at zero, negative two. So they're two units down, right? Zero, zero to zero, negative two. Um, all right, so I think that covers all the options individually that could happen. Um, although you can have all of them going on at the same time. Just about. You can't have a compression and a stretch at the same time. You can only have one or the other. But other than that, like you could have a stretch, a reflection, a horizontal shift, and a vertical shift all happening at once. Um, and that's not really that crazy. Um, if you took some of those ones that we were doing that were in general form and rewrote them in standard form, that's kind of what they're going to look like. Like they're going to have multiple transformations. Um, but uh, there, there are a couple of things where if you're comfortable with this notation, um, with standard form, that there are things you can pull out really quick, like what the vertex is. Um, so if you have standard form um, and, and you're, I guess, comfortable with it, you can go, oh, the vertex is just hk. You just have to identify what they are. Remember that the h has to be subtracted. So if you had something like... Um, I'll just make something up here. I'm going to put everything into this too. Um, so I'm going to get the, the stretch, the reflection, horizontal shift, and vertical shift. Everything. The kitchen sink is in there. Um, with this one, H is actually negative 6. Because if you want to write that with subtraction inside the parentheses, and this should be squared, um, it would be negative 5 times X minus negative 6 squared minus three. And so then here you would say that H is negative six and K is negative three. And so then the vertex would be negative six, negative three. 
So that's the one thing, if you're gonna use this maneuver here of just identifying the H and the K and going, there's my vertex, that's the one thing you gotta be careful about is when there's a plus in there um, that you've gotta rewrite it so it has a minus. Um, and so basically if there's a plus inside the parentheses, you're gonna end up with a negative X coordinate for your vertex ultimately, right? Like, like we did just now. Um, and then the X of symmetry, once again, it's the vertical line that goes straight through the vertex. So just x equals h. Um, and um, just like with general form earlier, the a out front, um, if you multiplied this out to turn it into general form, a would be the coefficient of x squared. So if a is positive, the parabola is going to open upward. If a is negative, the parabola is going to open downward. So that works just like it did before. All right. so. For these examples, um, we can do what we were doing before, although I'm gonna do these two different ways, so I gotta be careful about how big I write here. So, all right, part A is upward or downward. Well, the A is four, right? So A is four, so that means that it opens upward. Then the vertex, well, here h is 1, and then k is negative 6. So then that means that the vertex must be the point 1, negative 6. And then for c to get the domain and range, so the domain, as usual, all real numbers. Um, I'm just going to write these in interval notation because I want to make sure I got enough room on the right side of the page here. And then the range, well, we know it opens upward, the parabola, so the vertex must be the lowest point. So then the lowest y value that's going to show up is negative 6. So negative 6 is going to be in there and everything above if it opens upward. So that should be negative 6 to infinity, including the negative 6, right, because the vertex has that coordinate. Right, so it opens up where you get that kind of shape. All right, then, or the other way that you can do it, um, <clears throat> if you would rather just do this in general form, you could. So if you wanted to do it in general form, just multiply everything out. So that's what I'm going to do here. Like, what if you just multiplied out the x minus 1 quantity squared? Um, you could foil that. Right? And we could say f of x equals 4 times x minus 1 times x minus 1 minus 6. And you could FOIL this, right? The x minus 1 times x minus 1. <clears throat> and I guess if you want to multiply left to right, you can. But if you're multiplying a bunch of stuff, the order doesn't make a difference. So if you have a preference, you might as well use it. My preference is to FOIL first and then just run the 4 through it. So if you FOIL this, you'll get x squared minus 2x plus 1. And then if I distribute the 4, I'm going to have 4x squared minus 8x plus 4 minus, and then the minus 6 is still there, right? So then I've got two constant terms. I can combine them together and say this will be 4x squared minus 8x minus 2. And then from here, you could do what we were doing before. Um, still got that 4 as the leading coefficient. You go, all right, fine, that's positive. Parabola opens up. That's not the thing I was really interested in. The thing I was most concerned with was the vertex. So <clears throat> at this point, we've got a written general form, and you could use the vertex formula. So for the vertex, you could say that x is negative b over 2a. So that'll be the negation of negative 8 over 2 times 4 which would be the negation of negative 1, which is 1. And then f of 1 would be 4 times 1 squared minus 8 times 1 minus 2, which would end up being 4 minus 8 minus 2, which is negative 4 minus 2, which is negative 6. Oh, look. The vertex is going to be... 1, negative 6. So it still works, 
right? Um, and if you'd rather do that, that will work every single time. Um, so if you look at the standard form and you think, you know, I don't know about this, like with that horizontal shift, um, like, um, like maybe on a test or something, if you think I'm worried that I'm going to get the sign wrong, there is an, an alternate path which is just multiply it out, turn it back into general form, use the vertex formula if you'd rather do that. Um, and then number five, I guess we're gonna do the same things. So I guess I need to kind of section this off too because I wrote kind of low here. There we go. All right, so let's see, back to blue. All right, so first thing is opens up or opens down. You got that negative two, so a is a negative two, so that means it opens downward. All right, so we're gonna get that kind of shape. And then B, this I think is where you'd have to be careful. Um, the H, um, remember how it's supposed to be subtracted? It's supposed to be X minus H. H here is actually negative five, and it's like the thing on uh, the top of this page um, where we had the negative six. So it's the same thing, right? You would, you would say, well, f of x would be negative two times x minus negative five squared plus three. So then you could say that h is negative five and k equals three. And so then the vertex is gonna be negative five three. All right, then the domain and range. Let's see, the domain, this part won't be exciting. It's just all real numbers again. And then the range. All right, well, we know what the highest point is, right? If it opens downward, then the vertex must be the highest point. That's got a y coordinate of three, and if it's opening down, everything below three is also gonna show up as a y value somewhere, but nothing above three. So like set of all y such that y is less than or equal to three, or as an interval, negative infinity to three, and include the three, because that's the y coordinate of the vertex. Okay, um, and then once again, I figured this is worth stressing because this is one of those things where if you do get stuck and like on a test and you don't remember about the standard form, um, I think going back into the um, general form is probably your best move. Um, but this one involves distributing a negative, so I kind of want to run through this one. Um, I'm going to do the same stuff though, like I'm going to FOIL. So I'm going to rewrite f of x as negative 2 times x plus 5 times another x plus five and then plus three on the end and if i do the foiling first i'm gonna have negative two times x squared plus 10x plus 25 and then a plus three on the end um, distributing the negative two then i'm gonna have negative two x squared and then minus two times 10x and then minus two times 25, and it's still got plus three on the end. So we're gonna have negative two x squared minus 20 x, um, and then ultimately minus 47. Um, I guess I'm, I'm doing a couple of steps at once just to kind of save space here. But you get negative 50 plus three, and then that's gonna be negative 47. Um, this would be a nightmare to graph by hand because you would need your y-axis to go down negative 47 to get the y-intercept in there. Um, but we're not going to play that game. We're just going to get the vertex. So, so the vertex, um, all right, vertex formula. So x equals negative b over 2a. So that would be the negation of negative 20 over 2 times negative 2. That's the negation of negative 20 over negative 4. So ultimately, this is negative 5, right? Because negative 20 over negative 4 is 5. You negate that, you get negative 5, right? All right, well then f of negative 5 is going to be negative 2 times negative 5 squared 
minus 20 times negative 5 and then minus 47. So that would be negative 2 times 25 and then minus negative 100 minus 47. So that's negative 50 plus 100 minus 47. So that's going to be 50 minus 47, which is 3. So yeah, you get the same vertex, right? X coordinate negative 5, Y coordinate 3. So that's always an option. You can always switch back into general form. And I think that's it except for the word problems. I may have gone overboard with the word problems. I think there are actually more in here than the number that will show up in your homework. Um, but I figured this, and this one doesn't, like the kind that's in number six doesn't, but it's a kind of a good gateway to the other one. Because there are no peculiarities with number six in the setup. And the other ones, um, you have to kind of factor some extra things in. So with number six, um, a farmer has 3,000 feet of fence and wants to enclose the largest area. So what kind of rectangle is that? And if you're looking at that and going, like, automatically, it's a square, that is correct. It is a square, um, right? Like, that's, that's always going to be the case. Um, and, you know, you may not really need to go through all the math to figure it out, and that's fine. Um, the answer to number six isn't as important as how you do the setup, because the setup for the other ones is kind of similar. And so I just kind of want to get that backbone in there. That's really kind of what I was thinking with number six more than anything else. Um, but it's going to be some rectangle. So I'm going to draw a, a rectangle-esque shape here. Um, and then I guess I'm just going to say length and width for the two dimensions. Um, and I'm going, to draw, I'm going to write length as a cursive L so it doesn't look like a one. And then width over there. And there are two formulas that you're going to need for this sort of thing. One, um, I guess, would essentially be the perimeter. Um, and then the other one's area. So um, the perimeter would be 2L plus 2W here, right? Like if you just add up the individual lengths of fence, you could say it's L plus W plus L plus W, but you might as well combine like terms, right? So the things that we know right now, we know that 2L plus 2W equals 3,000. Um, right, so the two formulas I'm using, I should write those in a different color. So things that I'm using are perimeter of a rectangle, which is that P equals 2L plus 2W. And then the other one that I'm using, maybe a different color just for effect. Um, green sounds good. The area. of a rectangle. It looks like we need that formula because the thing we're supposed to figure out is the dimensions of largest area. They, they give you the largest area. Um, so it seems like area is a relevant concept here. So area is going to be length times width. And we're going to do most of the work with that. Because, um, so I guess I might as well go ahead and write it over here. We are going to use this. The area is length times width. The thing that would help to solve this is if we had area written in terms of a single dimension, or I guess just in an algebra sense, if we had it written in terms of a single variable. Like if it was all written in terms of L or all written in terms of W. So how do you pull that off? Well, basically what you do is you take the, the perimeter over here, the 2L plus 2W equals 3,000, solve that for one of them, either L or W, and then sub into the area. So I'm gonna solve for L. Let's see, so I'm just gonna subtract 2W from both sides. And we're gonna have that 2L is 3000 minus 2W. And then if I divide both sides by two to get L by itself, then really you end up doing this. I mean, yeah, you're, you can divide the whole thing by two, but when we simplify, it's gonna be easier to have those written as separate fractions. Cause then we can say that L is equal to 1500 minus W. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sub that in over here. 
And I'm going to say now A is 1500 minus W times W. All right, so I'm taking this and I'm putting it there. I'm just subbing directly in for L. But then if you multiply that out, so I guess if you distribute the W, you'll get, well, 1500W minus W squared. And I'm just going to re rewrite that with the W squared term in front, um, just so that way it looks like general form. Because really, this is where area is a function of width. Right, so this is just a function where w is the independent variable. Um, and then what do we know about this? Well, the coefficient of w squared is negative 1. So that means the parabola opens down. So, so the parabola opens down. This is very good news because if the parabola opens down, that means there's a highest point. And so that means that we would have a highest y value, but the y value is a more specific thing here because really if area is written as a function of width, the y value is the area. So then if there's a highest point, that's where you get the max area. And that's the thing that we're looking for. So the fact that it opens downward, that's fantastic. Um, so then that means that we get the max area at, I lost the ability to write, max area at vertex. So all we have to do really is get, um, I guess the value of W for the vertex, and then we should be able to get the length from there and we'll have it. So we can use the vertex formula to do that. So I guess back to blue. All right, so the vertex. I guess instead of x equals negative b over 2a, I should write it as w equals negative b over 2a, since that is our independent variable here. And b is 1,500, and then a is negative 1. So you have 1,500 over 2 times negative 1, and then that's going to be negative 1,500 over negative 2. So really that's the same as 1500 over 2 because those negatives are going to cancel out. That's going to be 750. And if if the width is 750, so is the length. So we'll get the largest area when W is 750 feet. And then we can just sub in to get length because we know that length is 1500 minus W from where we'd solved for L in terms of W. And we can just sub in and we can say then this would have to be 1500 minus 750, which is also 750 feet. That's a square, right? When the length and width are the same, all four sides are 750, right? Which is true, right? 3,000 divided by 4 is 750. So yeah, um, you get the square, just like we knew we were supposed to. Um, okay, the important thing, um, I guess, is um, to know how to, you take the perimeter, um, solve for one of the variables, then sub that into the area formula. That'll give you a quadratic equation where then you just have to go and figure out where the vertex is. Um, and that will basically be what we do in the other ones, even though the other ones are maybe a little bit more involved in terms of the shape. Um, they're not as, I guess, as straightforward as just make the rectangle. Um, there's some kind of wrinkle involved. So let's see, number seven. Farmer has 240 feet of fencing and wants to enclose a rectangular plot of land bordering a river. If the farmer does not fence along the river, what are the dimensions that enclose the largest area? Okay, so there's a river. He doesn't have to fence along that. So let me see. That's a, there's the river color. That has to be it, right? The light blue. What else am I going to use? All right, so here's the river. 
Should have color coded the last one too. Mm, we're gonna have a nice light brown fence. Um, so you don't have to fence along the river. Right, we just have to have this, right? And, and the river just serves as a barrier, right? So like if, um, if the farmer is fencing in some livestock, it's ones that can't swim. So the river, it's like an extra wall. Um, all right, so then we're gonna have, there's a width, there is a width, there is a length. But we only have one length, right? Because there's no fencing along the river. So what does that mean? At least for the part that would kind of be like where the perimeter was in the last one, then W plus L plus W has to be 240 or L plus 2W. So we know that L plus 2W has to be 240. And if we're gonna solve for one of these, it's much easier just to solve for L, right? Just subtract 2W from both sides. And then say that L is gonna be 240 minus 2w, and then we're going to use that, because the area, like this is still a rectangle, so the area is still going to be length times width. But now we have a way to write L in terms of w, so we're going to sub that in, and we're going to say this will be 240 minus 2w, then multiplied by w, right? So then I guess I can, I think I had like an, I did it with a dark brown arrow. I'm already using brown in this page. There. Right, we did that substitution, and then we can multiply that w through, and we'll get 240w minus 2w squared. And again, I'm gonna rewrite that so the w squared term goes first. So negative 2w squared plus 240w. And again, we have a parabola that opens down because we have that negative coefficient on the w squared, that negative two. So that means the max is gonna be at the vertex. So once again, we have a parabola that opens downward. And what that means is that you get the max area at the vertex. All right, so we're basically doing what we did last time. We're gonna get, we're gonna use the vertex formula and we should be able to get it from there. So, so the vertex, W equals the negation of B over 2A. So the negation of 240 over two times negative two. All right, so that's the negation of 240 over negative four. So the negation of negative 60, which is 60. All right, so then that should be enough to figure out what the length would have to be too. So we will get the max area when W is 60 feet, and then the length is 240 minus 2W, which would be 240 minus two times 60. So that's 240 minus 120, which is 120 feet. And that's the answer. So I guess I could box that in. I, haven't, I didn't really do it in the last one, but I can box it in this one. There we go. All right, so a little bit different in the initial setup because we were missing that one side, right? You don't have to fence along the water. And so that means that when you add up the individual sides um, and set that equal to how much fencing the farmer's got, then you don't have two L's, you just have one of them. Other than that, everything else was kind of similar, right? We solve for L, and then we subbed into the area formula, and once again, we're gonna get the parabola that opens down, so we just have to get the, basically the x-coordinate of the vertex, right? I use the vertex formula, that'll give you the width, and then you can substitute in to get the length. Um, the last one will also be like that. Um, the last one has a lot of little pieces. Uh, you'll see what I mean in the picture. All right, so the farmer's building a fence to enclose 
a rectangular area divided into three regions, like that in the picture. So there are the four walls and then two additional segments in the middle. So then that way it ends up being three enclosures that are adjacent to each other. Okay, so what are the dimensions of this thing? Well, we can still think of the horizontal dimensions as being the length. Right, so that's an L, and then on top, this is also an L. But then the width shows up four times, right? Because we've got these outer ones, but then we have the two inner ones that break it up um, into three enclosures. So what we're gonna end up with um, is that if the farmer has 706 feet of fencing, um, if he's gonna use all of it, that would mean that 2L plus 4W equals 706, right? Because in the picture, there are the two L's on the top and the bottom, and then going left to right, there are four W's in there. So, right, all of that has to be made out of fence. So that all gets factored in. Um, this one, let's see, 706 isn't divisible by four, um, right? Because 700 is, but six is not. So when you add them together, you get something that's not. Um, so I'm going to solve this one for L. So that way, even though we're solving for L yet again, at least this way we don't have to deal with non-integer values. So we can keep it all integers. I think that's what most people would go for. So I, and I ride right along in that boat with everybody else. So 2L is 706 minus 4W. And then if you divide both sides by 2 to get L by itself, So then L is going to be 353 minus 2W. And you know what comes next. It's still ultimately a rectangular shape. So the area would be the length times width. But then we can sub in for L with 353 minus 2W. Right? Certainly that was coming. And so now we've got area just in terms of a single variable. And then if we multiply through the W, we'll have 353W minus 2W squared. And as before, I'm just going to rewrite it so the W squared term goes first. So negative 2W squared plus 353W. Hey, look, it's another parabola that opens downward. All right, so then that's going to be a parabola opens down. So max area at vertex. So just like what we were doing before, we are going to use the vertex formula. So W would be, so negative b over 2a, so that's gonna be negative 353 over two times negative two. Hmm, we're not gonna get an integer this time. That's all right, can't get an integer every time. So those negatives are gonna cancel out. This is 353 over four which is 75 and 13 and I think 88.25? Yes, okay. All right. And if that's our width, um, then we're going to get our max area when W is 88 0.25 or 88 and a quarter feet. And then the length would be 353 minus 2w, which would be 353 minus 2 times 88.25, which is 160 and 16 and a half, so 176 and a half. So 353 minus 176 and a half, which itself is 176 and a half feet.
barely got that in. All right. Um, but all right. So we got one that um, wasn't uh, one where the answers were integers. That's okay. Like they're going to happen. Um, when they are integers, it's admittedly like a little bit contrived just to make sure that they're integers. Um, but I know that there are variations on the homework problems where you don't get integers. So like I had to kind of manufacture one where that didn't happen. Um, but this one, I mean, it's the same general setup, right? Um, you're going to sub into the area formula and then you've got it all just in terms of W and then parabola that opens down, figure out where the vertex is. Um, the beginning was a little bit different because it had all these extras in it. Um, like it had the two extra W's because it was broken up into multiple pieces. I think when it happens in the homework, it's less pieces. So there is something like this, but I think it just breaks it up into like two adjacent um, enclosures rather than three. Um, but it's the same idea, right? If it was two, in, uh, yeah. two adjacent enclosures, you'd have two L plus three W because then you only need one extra one in the middle. Um, but it ends up being pretty similar. So I think, I hope that'll cover everything for this section. Um, this video ended up being a little bit longer than I thought it would be, but I guess that's all right. Um, right? Better to get more stuff in, I suppose. But hopefully that'll take care of everything in 4D.